All right, so then we'll get started with this next chapter. And this next chapter, I want to hopefully convince you it's kind of the, the same game. Um, there are other conservational principles. We start with the easiest one, which is energy. But there are other things that also have to be true beginning and end. And so not only does energy have to be conserved, but another quantity called momentum has to be conserved. And so that's what this chapter is, is all about. And so that's why it says linear momentum and an important piece is collisions. And uh, well, I better just kind of jump into what momentum is. That's probably as much time as we'll have. What do we have? Like a half hour left. And so we'll just get kind of the, the starting point here of what is momentum and of course maybe more importantly what it is not because I want to emphasize that this principle of conservation of energy has to be true even when we're talking about momentum and so what can make this chapter a little bit harder than the energy chapter is that sometimes they will require you to not only do conservation of momentum, but also conservation of energy. So now we have a system of equations, right? We have two things that have to be conserved. And so not only do the energies have to match, the momentums have to match. All right, well, with that said, let me go ahead and begin this chapter with the definition of what is momentum, and particularly linear momentum. And so, chapter 8 begins here with this idea of what is linear momentum. And linear momentum is simply a product of two things we've already worked with. So there's the good side, that there's not a new uh, quantity. Well, I guess we have a new quantity, more momentum. But our new quantity is made out of the old ones. But I guess I would say that about energy. That was the neat thing about energy. Energy was just starting with Newton's second law, and we integrated both sides. And it might even look a little scary at first. It was like, ah, oh, look at all these integrals. But I kept trying to hold you and say, look, notice that I'll do the integrals for you now, and we'll end up with just an algebraic equation. And hopefully you'll feel comfortable by starting a problem by saying the energies I start with equal the energies I end with. And now I just have to do the algebra because the calculus is, is already done here. And I'm kind of saying the same thing, that the best way to kind of think about momentum is a grouping of quantities we've already done. And it might sound like we're making things harder. You, you could have said that about energy. You could say, well, aren't you just making it harder? I mean, all you're doing is taking Newton's second law and integrating it. What's the advantage? Well, I hope you saw it at the end, that there was a huge advantage because we've done the integrals. We don't have to do them again. But then it's just algebra to solve the problem, even when we have forces that, that change. And you're hopefully going to see the same thing here. We're not trying to make it harder just for the sake of making it harder, but by thinking about mass and velocity collectively together, there's some nice pieces that fall out. And I want to begin by pointing out, notice that linear momentum is going to be a vector. I think that alone makes it a little bit harder because when I said energy is conserved, did you notice I never put any arrowhead? Did you notice I just said energy you started with equals energy you end with? That's going to change here where I'm going to say momentum in the x and momentum in the y. So I got a column. I divide it in two and I say, all right, the momentum before equals the momentum after in the x, but that's also true in the in the y. And so this little equation here is really a conservational momentum twice. One for x and one for y. So we got to do then components again, right? And then we, we got to look at the velocity and say how much is in the x direction. So we got to do that little cosine theta again. So that's unfortunate 
but it's part of nature. We don't get to make the rules of nature. We just discover how nature behaves. And so momentum is very useful. Uh, energy, like I said, is why we do it first. It's easier. It's just a scalar. It's just a number. We never had energy in the x direction. We never said, hey, how much kinetic energy does it have in the x direction? We never said that. But here we're going to say how much momentum do we have in the x direction and how much momentum do we have in the y direction. It is a vector. And so that will be interesting here. Now we'll start simple and just have one dimension x, but that's our starting. Now this traditional symbol for momentum is the lowercase p. Which always brings up a question, why the p? Well, we're going to focus on this word impulse, and the third letter is a P. We don't want to use I because it gets in the way of other things, and we don't want to use M because it gets in the way of mass, and the tradition has got us to the third letter of impulse, a P. So let's not worry too much about the, the symbolism, but let me just tell you that is the symbol, and even then it's not a good choice because didn't we see a P a little while ago? At the end of the last chapter, what did I use the P for? So this is P for power. <coughs> this is P for momentum. You see a difference? Well, this is where putting an arrowhead will really help. Because you put an arrowhead over it, you know it's a vector. Power is just a scalar because that has to do with energy. So that's why I was making that big deal out of it. Although I must admit, sometimes we get pretty lazy and we're only dealing with one dimension anyways. And we drop the arrowhead. Can you tell the difference there? It's not very easy, so I'll try to point it out. And in this case, I'll do the old kindergarten worksheet. That is a lowercase p. This is an uppercase P. And I know it can easily be confused. So I will do my best to try to point it out, but it's a common question. Especially in a couple chapters for now, because then we get pressure, which we use a P for. And uh, always drives students crazy. And rightfully so, but just kind of giving you a heads up. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure, so if for the Greek alphabet, if there's, if you do that, there's no difference between them? Uh, well, we, uh, and I don't want to use a symbol from the Greek alphabet because as we're, as we're going to see, we're going to kind of reserve all symbols in the Greek alphabets, at least in mechanics, for things that rotate. And so we like our angles like theta and phi and alpha. Uh, so it's not that we, we couldn't, it's just kind of what has happened. <laughs> All right. So that's my way of saying the symbol P just seems like an oddball. And I got to admit it does. There's kind of a poor logical reason behind it. And it's just a confusing one. And so it's something we have to deal with. And so this is my way of saying be careful here. When I'm talking about momentum and power, I'll try to emphasize which one I'm talking about, either momentum or power or pressure which will be a capital P. <laughs> and it will be a scalar. And fortunately, we don't usually have power and pressure in the same type of problem. So we get away from that. Now, maybe also then, to begin this, I should talk about the units to measure this. So now you're getting a pretty big, good chart here going. I, I haven't put out a chart. I don't know if you do that in your notes, but if you remember, in that very first chapter, I put, you know, in this column, put your quantities, and over here, put your units. And we started off here with like distance, and we said that would be meters, and then we did area, and then we did volume, and then we did uh, speed, meters per second, then we did acceleration, then we did forces. Uh, now, if we, if we were to add two more to this list, we would have over here energy, which would be in joules. And maybe I will go back and put force, which would be in Newtons. Um, oh, we would have power, 
and now we have momentum. And so power, as you saw, is measured in a watt. And maybe if we break this down, a joule was a newton times a meter, which was that kilogram meters squared over seconds squared. And a watt was a joule per second, which if we broke it down into its basics, it, we're getting a lot of <laughs> distances and time in all of that. And so this here would be the, the piece. Here's some good news, I think, is the units for momentum, which would just be the mass kilograms and velocity meters per second, we just leave it that way. It's not given a name in honor of any great scientists. Uh, personally, I think that's a little unfair to poor Galileo. I think we should maybe call these units of Galilean or something, because, uh, but for whatever reason, tradition has started with Newton that we start naming the units after the great scientists who contributed to that field. And so we've got Newton, follow that with Joule and with Watts, and we'll see that with. Uh, uh, coulombs and amps and volts and Henry's and uh, the list goes on but prior to Newton momentum was already being discussed and thought about it and Galileo would I think be the rightful one to have the units named in his honor but nonetheless we don't and I think that makes it a little easier just we, hey, we don't have to worry about what it's called we just write it out However, notice this. this. This can be useful at times. If you multiply the top and bottom by seconds, so you don't, you don't change anything, you can group the kilogram, the meter, and the bottom second squared as a Newton and call it then a Newton times a second. And so, uh, personally, I like this best because it does show that it's a mass and a velocity. But as you'll see, forces are connected to momentum. And so it is nice to have Newtons in there. Uh, you'll see the equipment that uh, we will use in lab. We'll label it in these units instead of these units. Okay, so that's the, the first step. What is the definition of momentum? And so this is our new quantity. Now, why is that useful? Well, let's go back to Newton's second law. And by the way, did you notice that this is where I started when I did conservation of energy? <laughs> I wrote out Newton's law and then I integrated both sides. Mm -hmm because really energy is just kind of an extension of Newton's second law. You could argue that you don't even need it. It's really Newton's second law. However, this alternative approach with energy can be very powerful and of course therefore more useful than going through Newton's second law. So I keep saying this is a second approach to how you might do a problem. And I'm going to say the same thing here for momentum. Momentum we could really do without it. We, we could do everything with just Newton's second law. But this is so useful, so powerful, that it gives us an alternative way of doing collisions, for example. And that's why the title of this chapter is Linear Momentum and Collisions. Because you're going to see that the idea of momentum works best when you're dealing with two or more objects, not just one individual object. We would just go back to Newton's laws for that, or energy if we're just dealing with one individual object. But it's very powerful when we have two objects colliding into each other. All right, so let's look at Newton's second law for just a second. And let me write acceleration as the change in velocity over time. Because a change in velocity 
would be final velocity minus initial velocity. Ah, now if I do the distributive property with the mass, you begin to see how I have a product of mass and velocity together. Now you begin to see, okay, why this definition can be useful. Because I could write this as final momentum minus initial momentum. So instead of individual uh, uh, mass and velocity, I've got the product of the two. Uh, I could then even write that as the change in momentum over time. Ah. And let me just put a little circle around it. I won't put a square around it quite yet because we really haven't got to the principle of conservation of momentum. In fact, I don't, I don't think we even will today. Eh, maybe we will. We've got 10, 15 minutes here. But what this is is an alternative way of looking at Newton's second law. It says if you apply a force to it, it, here it said a force would give you an acceleration. Here I'm saying a force would give you a change in momentum. Here's why this view can be very important and different. Let's say that I come up and I have two objects in front of me. The first object's kind of small. It's just a bicycle with a small rider on it. The second is a big car. Fortunately, it's in neutral, so I can probably push it, but it's big. Now, let's say I come over here and I apply the same force to each of them. Let's just say 100 newtons. So I go 100 newtons for maybe one second. Now compare that to the big car. I go 100 newtons for one second. Do those two have the same acceleration? No, right? Not even close. I mean, we know that the acceleration would depend not just on the force, but did you notice I put the same force? But it would also depend upon their mass. And in this little story, I'm trying to say this, 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 this car has a huge amount of mass, and therefore it's going to have a very little acceleration. So if I do a force of 100 newtons, that bike rider is going pretty fast. Whereas on the car, if I do 100 newtons, the car is probably just barely moving. I don't end up with the same results. But I've done the same effort. I've done the same 100, but I don't get the same results. But when you look at it this way, there is something the same about those. A force of 100 newtons for one second is going to give you the same change in momentum. And so this bike and this car actually end up with the same amount of momentum. They don't end up with the same speed because they don't have the same mass, but they end up with the same amount of momentum. And that can be very useful because you could say, I put the same effort in. <laughs> same effort. You would expect the same results. And you do get the same results if you're thinking about the momentum of it, not the acceleration of them. And that's just kind of our first step of why, hey, maybe, maybe it would be better to think about them as a product of mass and velocity. Because the bike would look something like this. Small mass but big speed, whereas the car would be big mass and small speed. And they end up with the same amount of momentum. And that's the advantage you get when you're thinking in terms of momentum, not in terms of, of speed. And so we can do both, and we should do both, and we will do both. Now, here's where it gets even better. Let's take two objects. And so let's say I have objects one 
and let's see, from your play, so I'll call this one and this two. And so I'll just leave object one stationary for a moment and come along here and make object two collide into it. What happens during this collision? And let's think in terms of momentum. I mean, clearly in terms of acceleration, you see, doesn't this one put a force? Doesn't the second one put a force on the first one? And so the first one gets an acceleration that way? And, of course, this one has a force that way, so this one has an acceleration that way. So while this one is accelerating, this one is deaccelerating. And since they have the same mass, I think it wouldn't be too bad to look at them in terms of acceleration. But what if they had different masses? What if the first one was three times more massive than this one? Each of these mass bars is the same mass as those cards. And you come along and you collide. What happens before and after this collision? Could you tell me anything about how fast that one is going compared to that one? And something interesting, very useful and very interesting happens here. Let's, let's keep talking about this and let's write it out over here. Maybe we should look at the first cart. And I had the first cart stationary but everything I'm about to say would be the same whether it was stationary or not. I could have something that looks like this. Maybe it's already moving slowly and I run up behind it. But no matter how they collide, when they come together, so let me call this number one, And this number two, I would say that there is a force on number one coming from number two. And let me just look at number one for a moment, but let me use this equation. Now, if I rearrange that equation, and I put a number one here, a one here, and a one here, indicating this is the force on number one for a certain amount of time on number one. The product of those two together is the change in momentum of number one. So I would say number one does change its momentum, right? Number one, and I'll just go back to the easy case. So number one looks like this. It, it gained momentum, right? Number one by itself has no motion and no momentum, and then when it hits it from number two, it gains something. And that's what this little equation is saying. This equation is saying that there's going to be a change in momentum on number one based upon the force and the time on number one. But let's look at number two. Number two has a force on it, so there's a force on number two, and it's from number one. And if I were to do the same calculation, I would say, okay, let's look at the net force on number two. Multiply by the amount of time that that force is on number two. Then that would be the change in momentum of number two. So this would say, if I just looked at number two, number two would change its momentum. And, and you, again, you can see that. Here's number two. Number two is coming along, and it has momentum. It hits it. Oh, it's gone. Now it gets hit. Oh, gains, right? And so if your focus is individually, you would say they each changed their momentum. But let's look at them collectively. This is probably where we'll stop here today, although we don't have a class coming in behind us, so we'll, we'll just keep going until... 12.30. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but as I come over here,
I'm going to ask you, how does the force on number one compare to number two? So the force on one comes from number two. According to Newton's third law, the force on number two is equal and opposite. Now some of you were a little hesitant, so maybe I need to kind of repeat that. Remember Newton's third law? So if, in this case, if two puts a force on one, then one puts a force on two, they are equal and opposite. Uh, so I'm talking while they're hitting. Okay. So I'm not talking about the part where my hand is. So during the collision, right there. So during there, number two is putting a force on number one. Yeah. yeah. And so I've got little magnets in here. I don't know if you can kind of see them interact here. Uh, so they don't actually, I don't want them to actually hit, crack the plastic. But what I do want you to see is that if this is number two right now, number two just put a force on number one. But because of Newton's third law, number one puts a force back on number two. And a very important magical step here is Newton's third law. How do those two forces compare? Is one of them bigger than the other? No. What if there was more mass on this one? Doesn't matter. The forces are still equal. Right? What if, what if one's going fast and one's going slow? What if one's heavy? What if one is red and one is blue? See, none of that matters. Newton's third law says they are equal and opposite, period. They can go fast, they can go slow, they can be big, they can be small. They're equal and opposite. So when it comes to a collision, I can say that these two forces are equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. And so maybe I'll write it this way. Net force of number one is equal and opposite to net force of number two. Well, let me ask you this, the time of the collision, T1 and delta T2, how do those compare? Well, they got to be the same. It doesn't make sense, right? I mean, the amount of time they're collecting, since they're interacting with each other, you don't have one interacting with the other longer. I mean, they, if this one's putting a force on this one, this one puts a force back for the same amount of time. The magnitude is equal and opposite. The time is the same. And this is where our conservation of momentum comes into play. What would you say about the change of momentum of number one compared to the change in momentum of number two. Wouldn't they then have to be equal and opposite? And so because of Newton's second law and third law, and that's what I'm trying to show you, if I put Newton's second law together with Newton's third law, I come to the conclusion that if I use this definition of momentum, something very interesting happens here. And that's this. That if this one comes in and loses momentum, this one gains exactly the same amount. So if I were to look at the total momentum of the two together, what could I say? It's conserved. There is no increase or decrease. One loses the other gains. And so this principle, as I was saying, is very powerful because what I know is an interacting system, so more than one object, the total momentum will not change. And so right here, that one gained momentum and that one lost the same amount. If I happen to give this enough speed so that the momentum here is 10, watch, it goes from 10 to zero. But did you see this one? It went from zero to 10. And so this lost 10, this gained 10, total momentum doesn't change. So I could make myself a little equation that says momentum before equals momentum after and start to do some calculations.
well, this will be a good place to stop for today and say, okay, you're starting to get the idea, but let's continue on on this uh, tomorrow. All right. We'll see you. Ah, good. I think I got recording on fine. All right, well, uh, let's begin. We're uh, back here uh, another day for uh, you guys in person. I kind of just explained the scenario that we're uh, missing a camera person right now, stuck in traffic. I think he'll be here who knows when, you know, you never know about uh, traffic. Uh, but for you guys online then, uh, I've just kind of set the camera, zoomed it on this one board so I could also do the overhead and the equipment. And so we'll just kind of stay focused here until the cameraman gets here and so we'll just uh, work on it uh, from that aspect so with that in mind let me pick up where we uh, left off uh, we were in chapter 8 uh, we had worked out kind of the, the fundamentals of why conservation of momentum even works and so I want to kind of begin there and say all right so what I had on the board here was a cart let's say number one coming and crashing or pushing or some kind of interaction between the two. See, because what was important then is number two, putting a force on number one, so I'll just call it F1, is equal and opposite to the force on number two from number one. And then we said that there would be a change in momentum based upon the net force of number one and the time taken. And so if we look at number one and number one and number one, and then we do the same thinking for number two, we conclude here, because of Newton's third law and also because of Newton's second law, so we got this equation because of Newton's second law, and we got Newton's third law to say they're equal and opposite. If we think about the two collectively together, when one loses momentum, the other one gains momentum. And so this is the same game that we just got done with our conservation of energy. What we can do then is start a particular problem and do something like this and saying, all right, how much momentum do you have to begin with? The initial momentum must then equal the final momentum. And so that's, I wasn't sure if we got quite to that equation yesterday at the end, but that's what I was trying to say, that what we are having in this chapter then is this conservation of momentum. And so just like conservation of energy, we will have this principle of conservation of momentum and we'll say the total momentum is conserved. Now, what's real important here is you realize that I'm talking, of course, about the whole momentum, and so you can't just look at one object. You gotta look at the two interacting objects, because one object by itself clearly changes its momentum. Uh, this was my silly analogy. I did the same thing when we were doing uh, energy, but if you had, you know, you and four of your friends at poker night, you know that one individual person may gain or lose money, but collectively, the whole group, the total is still that $100. And so we're gonna see that same thing. So I think the, the easiest way maybe to illustrate this is with some examples and some calculations here. So let me get a little drying rag here and say what if I had something to this effect and I've set it up here in front what if I take this track and I'll put it a little closer here towards the camera and maybe one of these carts and uh, I'll grab this cart here because this cart does not have any magnets and so if I take the first cart and leave it stationary and the second cart I make it move they'll hit they'll collide and they'll 
stick together. There's a little Velcro between them. And so if I was looking at this and said, all right, could you tell me the speed of these two after the collision? Okay. Well, here is a collision. And of course, you can kind of see that the first one gains some momentum. It starts to move. And the second one loses it. But the trick to this problem is to say, hey, momentum doesn't change. If I include the two interacting objects, momentum stays the same. And I, I want to keep saying that. Uh, sometimes we use a fancy word we call for an isolated system the momentum is conserved. See, because clearly, if there was something else pushing on, pulling on it, let's say this was going on at the same time here, and while it did that, I pick up the whole car and I push it, obviously the momentum doesn't stay the same. Obviously, I have interacted with them. Now, if you want to include all three of us, the two carts and me, then you might say, okay, then the momentum is conserved if I include all three. But if you leave something out of it, and so that's why we say for an isolated system, so nothing else influencing it. I like to just say, make sure you include the two objects that are interacting. If you don't include the two objects, well, clearly then the momentum is not conserved. It would be like you're just adding up the money from your three friends at, in the end of Polkadot. If you only did it for three friends, there's nothing to say that those three friends can't have more than the $60 they came in with or less than the $60. It's you got to include everything. And that's the same thing. So we, we like to use that fancy word for an isolated system. Okay, so for an isolated system, and so let's just take these two, and they're my isolated system, and I have got them on these tracks that have really low friction. So if there was a, a significant amount of friction, I would have to say, ooh, I, I can't do this because it's not isolated. Okay, but in this case, I'll say it's isolated. They come together, they hit one another, and my question would be, what is the speed after the collision? And so let's call that problem number one. Because also, I want to do at the same time, or at least tandem with it, uh, problem number two. Now, now problem number two is going to look like this. Problem number two is going to be, I'm going to take the carts, and this time I'm going to spin number two around, because number two has magnets on this side. And so again, let's have an interaction. Let, let's have a collision. And so number two comes along, bumps number one, but something different happens here. In this case, they don't touch. They don't stick together. The magnets push on each other. And as you can see, number one starts to move, and number two came to a stop. And so here we had it like that, and that's our interaction. But I want to emphasize, and this is why conservation of momentum is a powerful tool, the momentum's conserved no matter how they interacted, whether they stick together or not. See, did you, did you, did you catch that in that derivation? That's why we all like to do the derivations. We like to go through and say, look, this is not just one specific case. This is a fundamental principle. This is a fundamental, right, Physics is about knowing how to apply a few, but powerful, fundamental uh, principles to explain a universe of phenomenon. And you will see that. And so let's do the two in tandem here. And so I'm going to say, all right, let's say the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. And just to remind you, this is the ones that stick together. Okay. So I will spin this around and say, all right, here they go, and they stick together. Now, I guess I would write it this way. My initial momentum needs to include both objects. So let me call this mass 1 V1 plus mass 2 V2. Uh, maybe I'll even put a little I under here because this is the velocity before the collision. Then after the collision, I might call this mass 1 times velocity 1, and then also mass 2 times velocity 2. And again, I might put a little F here for final. 
so that would be the general equation. That would be taking the total momentum of both objects before, setting it equal to both after. Now, if I apply it to this specific case, I would say that this term is zero. No, uh, which one? I had the first one stationary, sorry. The first one was stationary. And so the first one, I would say, had no speed. And so here it is, no speed, which, of course, means m times v would come out to be 0. And then this one here, let me just write as m times initial speed. I'll drop the 2's because both of these cards, at least in this case, have the same mass. Uh, I can change all that, but these are just identical cards. So there's no point in calling it mass 1 and mass 2 for this very first simple one. And there's no point in calling it initial speed 1 and initial speed 2. There's only one that has an initial speed. So we'll just say this number 2 has that initial speed. But then when they stick together, I would do something like this, m1, and I'll just call it final speed, and m2 and final speed. And again, in this case, there's probably no point in calling it final speed 1 or final speed 2, because they're stuck together. So they're, they're moving at the same speed. And then also, remember I said that m1 and m2 are the same mass. So maybe I'll just call this 2m times the final speed. And so the conclusion I can come up with, after canceling off the masses being the same, and moving the 2 to the other side, I would say that the final speed is half of the initial speed. And now that we've done all that math, doesn't that kind of make sense that, well, yeah, of course it's half the speed because you kind of doubled the mass. I mean, I, I know that the first one was never moving, so if you think about what's moving, you have this, and then when it hits, you have, have twice the mass moving. And in order to have the same momentum, you're going to have to have half the velocity since you now doubled the mass. And so that's what we get after working through all this mathematics. Now, again, the same is true on the flip side. On the flip side, if I go ahead and do the magnet one, I can start off and say the same thing, that the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. And I would kind of maybe start off the same way by saying m1 v1 initial plus m2 v2 initial has to equal to m1 v1 final plus m2 v2 final. So, so that's the general principle, right? It would be true for any interaction. And I'll say it in my own sick little way. Would you like to know the answers to all the homework problems? You guys aren't smiling anymore. Or maybe you are. I can't tell under your masks. <laughs> I know it gets a little old here, but I hopefully, when I keep saying that, you begin to get that feeling and that emphasis how physics can be very different than a lot of other classes in the sense that we're trying to give you fundamental principles and then we give you all these crazy problems and it looks like, oh my gosh, how could I possibly do that? I mean, it almost seems like you read the textbook or you came to the lecture and they talked about A, B, and C and then you turn into the homework problems and they ask you about D, E, and F. And you're like, well, I, I, how do I do these problems? <laughs> this is not what they talked about. But I assure you they did. It's maybe a good analogy is the book and me are trying to teach you how to cut and hammer. And then we turn around and say, make a doghouse. You're like, what? You didn't talk about dog houses. You talked about hammering and nailing. And then all of a sudden, you want me to build a, a dog house. 
and when you begin to see that analogy, and I'll keep saying it, hopefully it falls into place. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. Because, see, we've taught you the fundamentals. And so we could ask you to build a dog house, a hen house, an out house, a farm house, whatever it is, because we taught you how to cut and saw, or saw and hammer, right? So that's kind of what's going on here. And so notice then that I've done the same thing. Even though this one stuck together and this one bounced off, it really doesn't matter what goes on. I'm just going to say, if I got two interacting objects, the momentum before equals momentum after. That's what I know for sure. And that really is going to be the way we're going to answer all these homework problems. Okay, so let's work on this one. Uh, this one kind of has the same initial conditions where number one is stationary, and so I'll just write this as mass of the second one. I won't even put a one or a two because there's just identical masses. Uh, then I'll just say initial velocity again because it's only number two that's moving. So, so it's pretty obvious which one's moving. Uh, but now something interesting happens a little different afterwards compared to when they stuck together. And in this case, you probably watched number one begin to move, but you watched number two stop. And so I would say then I can put a zero there for number two. It has no speed. And then this would just be an mv1 final. And I'll just again drop the one because they each have the same mass. I suppose I could even drop the one on the velocity because again looking at it I see that it's number, yeah it's only number one that's moving, number two has come to a stop. And then when I cancel off the M's, I come to the conclusion that the final speed of number one ends up being the same as the initial speed, I'll put the two back in there, as number two. And again, if you kind of stop and think about that, you go, oh yeah, that, that makes total sense. I mean, that means that as this goes along, in order to have the same amount of momentum, this one needs to be moving with the same speed that that one has because they had the same mass. And so now you're like, oh yeah, that, that makes total sense. And so I wanted to, as I said, just do these two in parallel. We'll do some examples here in a second, but these two in parallel illustrate the big picture that I'm just going to say, momentum before equals momentum after, and then kind of look at what happened. What are their masses? Did they stick together? What's going on? Whereas over here, I'll look at the scenario that happened here. And there's, as you could imagine, thousands of different scenarios that can be laid out, but they're all based on the same idea that the momentum before will equal momentum after. Now this might be a good time to kind of pause and maybe say, wait, what about the last chapter? The last chapter had this conservation of energy. Does that come into play? And I want to emphasize that yeah, don't forget about that. That too comes into play. However, when we look at the energies, we have a whole different scenario, if you will. In other words, we have like kinetic energies and potential energies. And they both have to happen at the same time. And so maybe I'll change over to maybe a red color here. But as I look at this first scenario, and let's see if I can kind of squeeze it on this little board here, um, maybe to help me, I'll go ahead and leave this information here when they stuck together. But I also want to talk about the conservation of energy for this problem. And so to do that, I guess I would do this, that the energy before the collision also equals the energy after the collision. And I want to do this as an example for you guys in person, you guys online, that where this can get a little harder is I got to think about both happening simultaneously. They're both going on. 
Now, if all you were asking for was the final speed, we would be done, and we only needed conservation of momentum to get there. But if you look at the conservation of energy part of this, you might say, okay, before the collision, so let me turn it around again, and say, okay, as it's coming along, before the collision, I'm thinking about that whole chapter on energy. Remember, some of that energy was the elastic energy, that one-half kx squared. It'll be okay if I ignore that one. There's no springs in this problem. All right, I'll just not even think about that one. Uh, another one was the gravitational potential energy as it goes up or downhill. This doesn't happen in this one. And so I would say before the collision, the only energy of interest really is a kinetic energy, and it's kinetic energy of number two. So I would say then uh, one half m the initial number two squared. And as we mentioned, you probably don't even need to put number two in there. So it's hopefully pretty obvious only number two is moving. So this would be the initial energy, and it's only kinetic energy. Of course, you can see now they stick together and, and start to move. And so I would say after the collision, I have a one-half. But now I would say I have an object that has doubled the mass. Right? The two of them are, are stuck together. So when I say kinetic energy is one-half mv squared, I'm going to think of this as one object, and its mass is now twice m. And then, of course, it would be final speed squared. Now I'm going to put a plus sign here because, remember, it's all the energies. The principle of conservation of energy only works if you add up all the energies, right? Uh, just like the principle of conservation of momentum only works if you include both objects. So we have to be real careful with how we apply it. And here's why I say all the energies, because again, we got to look at what's going on. We already said there were no springs, so I'm not going to worry about that. We already said it didn't go uphill or downhill, so I don't have any gravitational potential energy. But I am missing an energy. What else is going on? And sometimes this can be harder to see. Did you see that they actually touched? D didn't the first one kind of ram in, or I guess it's the second one, ram into the first one? And so there's going to be some rubbing going on. Again, maybe this is worth showing you a, a second time. Do you remember what the difference is between something hot and something cold? And so here is kind of our model. I'll even turn it down. So this would be something cold where the molecules are barely moving. And then when you warm it up, they go fast. And I call that kind of an internal kinetic energy. And so I would argue here that what has happened is there was rubbing where they hit each other. And the molecules there are now moving a little faster. And that's what I called heat energy. And so I'll put heat. In fact, if I didn't put heat on here, watch what would happen. Uh, I could write this as one half m v initial squared. I could then cancel this one half with the two and then just have an m. And then if I took the final speed here and I squared it, that would become initial speed squared over 4. And you can begin to see that if I didn't have this term here, there's no way these then would match. And so without any heat, you would say, oh, conservation of energy doesn't work. <laughs> and I want to emphasize Yes, it does work if you include all the energies. Oh, hey, Ron. <laughs> uh, oh, good. You can check see if I'm still pointing in the right place. <laughs> so this is a necessity 
if you will, but it's also hopefully very obvious that I had rubbing going on here. Uh, in fact, I can then see that I can then use first the principle of conservation of momentum to get the speed then I could go back and use the principle of conservation of energy to work out a question about well how much heat was actually created and so if I were to move this over and subtract let's see one half minus one quarter makes a quarter and so I can now answer not only must there have been heat but it must have been of this value so that this plus this equals that and so I would put this as the idea that okay how much heat is created I would say it's the same as the amount of kinetic energy that's left over and so whatever I started with in terms of kinetic energy so just for the sake of discussion let's say this is 10 joules of kinetic energy it hits this math is saying that after they collide we only have half of that five joules left as kinetic energy and the other five joules are now in heat energy and that's how the principles together can work and I can answer a lot of really complicated questions by putting the two together. Now as a side note if there is any heat we refer to this as an inelastic collision and so I would have to call this then inelastic uh, that is some heat was created along in the in the process. Okay. Now, if no heat is created, we call it inelastic. Maybe another way of saying the same thing is if the kinetic energy after equals the kinetic energy before, it's a elastic. So elastic really means that when these things come together and they bump, they must do it in such a way that they don't make the molecules inside rub and bump and go any faster so they don't make any heat and so maybe now you're seeing why I gave you the second scenario where I put the magnets together because the magnets then push on each other the material never actually hit they never rub they never bump and I have a strong suspicion then that I will not get any heat in this and this would be an elastic collision and I can even prove it to you. Let's come over here and let's do the same logic here. Let me erase my calculations of momentum. Let me leave the result of the conservation of momentum. Uh, let me now calculate thinking about the energies and I would say the same thing that I would start off with some initial kinetic energy they come along and they push on each other and as we said number two then stops so I'll say that one has no kinetic energy but number one obviously does have some kinetic energy so I'll go one half M and I'll call it V1 final squared and if they did bump and rub uh, then I guess there would be a factor of heat thrown in here but the reason I can say they don't bump and rub not just from the visual picture that they didn't actually touch but watch this when I put in my information from conservation of momentum which says that the final speed is equal to the initial speed and I do the math I see that when I bring this over and subtract I get zero heat and so I'm going to refer to this then as elastic now a little warning here just because I did the elastic collision with magnets does not mean that it has to always be 
magnets. Uh, your author does a good job. He's got two carts and uh, he shows a picture of the first cart mounted with a spring. And so the first one comes along, compresses the spring and bounces off. And again, what happens is the spring just kind of pushes down, snaps back, but never did the motion go to the molecules. Uh, hard objects tend to maybe hit and kind of on a microscopic level squeeze in like a spring and then bounce off and don't create any heat. And so there are a lot of cases where we can have elastic. But there's a lot of cases where we can have inelastic collisions. Now, it's beyond where I really want to go today, but I would say this, and you see it in this problem, do you see that in the elastic collision, the speed of the one coming in is equal to the speed of the one going out if they have the same mass? Because it was Newton who noticed this and built what we call Newton's cradle. It's kind of a fun little experiment where you put five objects in a row, you take the first object, you give it a speed, and they're really hard material. So when you let it go and it collides, we say this was going to be an elastic collision. So there's no, no heat. Also, because of the momentum side of it, the only solution to this is a second object moving at the same speed with the same mass. And so when you drop one object in, what happens on the other side is one object comes out. Now mine shakes around a little bit so it's less than perfect. But it's kind of fun to watch this when you change the mass to two of them. Because what comes out the other side? The same mass at the same speed. So it has to be two of them. Or you change it to three objects. And what comes out the other side is three objects at the same speed. And of course, we can continue this with four objects. Whoa. And kind of boring, but it does work with five objects. Five in and five out. <laughs> they just don't hit anything. But you kind of get this idea. So, without maybe spending too much more time here, because we've got one more real tough one to do here, is you see that idea. So, the last one to do is probably best shown with a picture. It is a conservation of momentum, but uh, as I was kind of teasing you and you were shaking your head, it, it, you may read the book and say, ooh, how does I do a problem like this? It didn't even talk about it. And this is referred to as rocket propulsion. Working with rockets can be really challenging because something like 90% of their mass is fuel. And so as it burns, even though you have a constant force coming out of the rocket, the mass of the rocket goes significantly down. So to figure out what's the speed of the rocket can become a real challenging problem because even though the force is constant, the acceleration is not because the mass goes down. And so your author does a good job here of kind of looking at the rocket problem here. And it does involve enough mathematics here that I thought I better take a moment and look at the mathematics. Uh, here's kind of the picture. Let's say we have a rocket 
and just for the sake of discussion let's say it's already moving at some speed v and maybe also to keep it simple let's just pretend there's no gravity obviously it, you know real rocket where it's on earth we've got to overcome the gravity and we can add that in later but let's just try to do that challenging part of we've got a rocket <clears throat> in outer space somewhere far away from the other planets and as it fires its thrusters it then becomes lighter and lighter and so even though it's firing its thrusters at the same rate even though it's giving it the same amount of thrust the acceleration keeps getting more and more and more and so the question might ask well how fast is it going to go after it burns say half of its fuel or maybe all of its fuel okay and so this is done really well with momentum, very hard with Newton's second law, and here's what your author says. Let's look at before we shoot a little bit of fuel, which he calls delta M, out of the bottom. And so I'll come over here, and we've got a lot of math to do here, and I'll say, let's start this problem by saying the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. And this will give me a chance to, to say, okay, see how I'm going to solve every problem in this chapter with the principle of conservation of momentum. Now, I probably have to do conservation of energy also because I learned that. I probably have to do Newton's second law because I learned that. I probably have to learn how to do the kinematic equations because I learned that. So, I mean, I might have to put everything, all these other things together here. But if I start off and say, the mass times the velocity is how much momentum this current rocket ship has. And so here it is. It says it has a mass of m. And the m includes everything. So it includes the fuel and everything that is needed to run the rocket. So the rocket engine, and let's say that's a payload. Let's say we're trying to launch a satellite here from Vandenberg, and so we've got this, we've got this satellite we want to put up. We've got all these metal pieces. We've got this engine, but we still have probably 80 to 90 percent of the weight is the fuel itself in order to get it to a high speed at a high altitude. And so what happens here is when by burning the fuel, we'll say, in a microscopic amount of time, a little bit of fuel, dm, comes out the back. All right. So I would now say that the rocket has a lower mass. It is m minus dm. And that's what your author is trying to, to say here. And so just a, a little bit loss of mass. Now, of course, that mass went somewhere, and so we would have to say that the rocket now gained a small amount of speed. So, it lost a little bit of mass, and in the process, that equal and opposite force gave it a new speed. So, I would call this the mass, I mean, the uh, momentum of the rocket, but let's also include now this ejected fuel. And so I then have a delta M. And I could say, okay, what is the speed of this fuel? And your author kind of points out here that if the rocket ship is moving with a velocity V, you might label how fast do the gases come out of the back of the rocket? Now, he labels it as the velocity of the exhaust gas, V sub E. So, if the rocket was going, say, 100 miles an hour this way, and then it gets ejected from the back of the rocket at 400 miles, I guess we would say 100 minus 400 and so the speed of the gas from somebody standing on the earth would say negative 300 because it left the rocket at 400 but the rocket's already going 100 that way so your author says let's call this then v of the rocket minus the velocity 
of the exhaust gas. And this looks like some tough mathematics, but with a little bit of calculus, okay, so maybe that's the tough mathematics, it actually comes into play really easy. So I'm going to leave the left-hand side alone. I'm going to multiply this out. So I've got an MV, uh, then I got an M delta V, I got a delta MV, and then I get a minus a delta M delta V. And so that's the foil on that piece. Uh, then I'll do this one, delta M V minus delta M V of the exhaust. And so remember, V is the velocity of the rocket ship, and V sub E is the velocity of the exhaust. But you can see that I've got like terms on each side. I can cancel those off. I even have in here... Um, That these, yeah, these two looks like like terms, a delta m times a v and a delta m times a v, and one is a plus, and one is a a minus. And so then I'll put a zero here and kind of take a look at what I have so far. Uh, maybe I'll call this then the mass of the rocket ship. And here's where I'm going to do a little bit of calculus. Let's just say this happens in a very, very short amount of time. And so this is where our calculus comes in. We could say it's an infinitesimal amount of time. And so I'll change this to a dV. This is interesting because this would be a really small amount, let's say like one millionth. So maybe this is one millionth and this is one millionth, but it's time another microscopic amount. And so I'm going to say that term is small, extremely small, negligible, and the limit goes to zero. And so I'm going to throw that one out. And then I'm going to have over here a change in mass times the velocity of the exhaust. And so then fortunately, if I just kind of move this over to here, I have a dm and it becomes positive. I'm going to put a v sub e, but I'm just going to put it in front so it looks a little bit more like calculus, equals to m dv. Since I'm kind of curious in what is the final speed of the rocket, let me get V by itself. But this is a dV, so I'm going to have to integrate it to get to a V. So I'm going to divide both sides by M so that I now have dV equals to the velocity of the exhaust gas dm over m. And now, with a little bit of calculus, I could integrate from some initial speed to some final speed. Uh, so again, I might be asking that, hey, maybe the rocket and one particular moment in time has a speed of 100 miles an hour and then I burn, say, a thousand kilograms of fuel, what is its new speed? And, and that's what this is going to give me. So I'm going to integrate, and the right-hand side is pretty easy. This would just be final speed minus initial speed. And that kind of makes sense if you kind of think about your calculus. This, this is a little change in speed, and so I'd add up a bunch of little changes. That would be the total change in, in speed if I burn this thousand kilograms of fuel. This one's a little harder. This one's going to take a little bit of thought. And so maybe what I'll do is do it in a couple of steps here. And maybe the first one is to say, that, well, this number is just the speed 
at which the gases come out of the back of the rocket. So that's a constant. So that's just going to be V sub E. That's the rate at which the uh, speed comes out of the rocket. And I should say relative to the rocket. That's why you might have been looking at the beginning saying, well, why, why write it this way? And, and this is why. So that we could say that the speed coming out of the back of the rocket is a constant number. And so if you're going, uh, if you're on the rocket, the fuel comes out at say 400 miles an hour. And if you're going a little faster, the, the fuel is still coming out <laughs> at 400 miles an hour. Okay, so that's a constant. That makes the calculus easy. And it doesn't surprise us that the speed of the fuel coming out the end is related ultimately to how much speed does it gain. Okay, fair enough. The harder one here is making sure we read the math. Because let's go back and look at this M. What, would the, what did the M mean again? Isn't the mass of the rocket? So I'm going to put a little capital R underneath it. Because capital R is the mass of, I mean, the M is the rocket. But what was this DM? Which when we started our discussion, we wrote it as an algebra term instead of a calculus term, a delta M. Well, come back to this picture. This delta M is really that microscopic amount of gases that leave. But where'd they come from? Well, they came from the rockets. I guess here's what I'm trying to say is the delta M is for the gas that comes out. But because it came from the rocket, I would say that must equal to delta M of the rocket. In other words, in terms of magnitude, what is lost by the rocket is gained by the gases as they exit. Hopefully that's pretty straightforward. But sign-wise, they're opposite. And so as we, as we burn the fuel, the rocket loses mass and the exhaust gas gains mass. So they're equal in magnitude, opposite in sign. So what I'm going to do is put a negative dmr over mr to indicate now that the m's are the same object. Because before I did that step, you might have been tempted to just say, well, I just have an integral of dm over m. And you might have treated them as the same variable. And they weren't. But they were related. In a very easy way. They were equal in magnitude opposite. So that's where the negative sign comes into play. And now I have an equation that has the same variable. Now I can integrate it. And let me do this. Let me integrate it and say, let's say the rocket starts with some initial mass. And I burn it until it gets to a final mass. So I'm going to move the negative out in front. Then I have an integral of dm over m. And I don't know if I should call this a hard integral or not. Anybody in your in class, you know what that integral is? Good, it's the natural log one. I remember doing one uh, video solution and early on that was giving people a lot of troubles and then I realized why and uh, well and that wasn't the only thing but that was one thing and some other ones and so if you if you watch that one you watch me say oh this this is a hard one this was ooh, harder than I thought oh it, and it came out of the university physics one and so anyways so this is the natural log so good you remember that one and so here is the natural log of M evaluated from some initial and I should put rocket to some final And now we've done the hard stuff. Now let's just do a little bit more algebra. Um, I'll put minus the uh, velocity of the exhaust gas. 
I'll put then in parentheses the natural log of the final mass minus the natural log of the initial mass. There is some nice properties of logarithms, right? When you subtract them, you can write that as a quotient. So we can write this as the natural log of the final mass over the initial. There's another nice property of logarithms. Maybe I'll put it over here. But if you had the natural log of x to the n, that would be the same as n natural log of x. We often call this the log roll because you can roll the exponent down from the log. I'm going to do the reverse of the log roll. I'm going to take this negative and roll it up to the exponent. Because when I do that, that just means take the reciprocal and so I can finish this calculation by saying the change in speed would then be equal to the exhaust gas times the natural log of the ratio of what did I start with compared to what do I end with. And so now you can begin to see that the two big things to get a rocket going really fast would be one, make sure the speed of the exhaust gases coming out are very, very fast. And number two, try to get your final speed, your final mass as low as possible in comparison to your starting mass. And that kind of makes sense, especially if you're launching a satellite. You, you ultimately just want the satellite moving. And so if you burn all your rocket fuel, maybe this final mass is only 10% of what you originally started with. And so, like I said, I hope that wasn't too much calculus or too much time, but it's a, it's a tough problem. And uh, your author kind of comes through this and again, gives you the end result. And it gives me a chance uh, somewhere he put the end results. Here's a picture of the space shuttle. Oh, there he goes. And he talks about the different numbers in there. But you can see he has the same numbers here and the same result that, that, that I have here. What is that final uh, uh, speed here? Which is why I wanted to bring this out. Actually, I guess I wanted to do it just so I could write it again. Do you remember our little rocket? And so the last time we did this, we did the rocket motion based upon Newton's second law. And something like this, I've got a reasonable amount of fuel, but me and the cart and the container is probably two-thirds of the overall mass. And so in my case, I'm probably looking at something like this, my final is two-thirds of what I start with. So this would be the natural log of 1.5. And I don't know what the, the speed is, but again, just to kind of illustrate it here, I'll put the jet, or not the jet, sorry, the rocket exhaust over here, pull out the safety pin, and say one, two, three, go! And, whoa, and I don't have enough room to go very far, but that device does get lighter and lighter and lighter. And so figuring out its ultimate speed would have been, and notice I said, would have been a hard problem if I had done it with Newton's second law. It's not really too bad. It does involve some calculus when I do it in terms of momentum. And now you can really see why we are learning these second ways, these cons conservational principles. And so we can look at our mechanics not only in terms of Newton's three laws of motion, which we already are learned, but now we can say, well, let's look at it from an energy or a momentum point of view, and we can make harder problems maybe easier just because we've got these two options. And so I'm going to encourage you, obviously, that during a test, you want to go the easy direction, not the hard direction. You would not want to solve this rocket problem with Newton's second law, but it wouldn't be too bad 
with momentum. All right, well, I hope I uh, left myself a reasonable amount of time to maybe show you some good calculations here. Uh, let me scroll down and uh, do a few before we roll into the next chapter here. Uh, I put number 10 on my list here uh, for the uh, first one. And so let's talk about that. And there was a couple reasons, but one of them is because the author uses, I believe this is the one, where he uses the word impulse. And I don't believe I've actually used the word impulse, and I wanted to make sure I mentioned it, because a lot of people, myself being one of them, don't use the word impulse very often because impulse is the same as change in momentum. So we just like to say change in momentum and that way we're thinking about momentum and then it's change whereas saying the word impulse almost sounds like there's two things going on in this chapter. One is momentum and one is impulse. So. I'll read number 10 and, and say here, it says here, a professional boxer hits his opponents with a 1,000 Newton horizontal blow that lasts for 0.15 seconds. And actually, now that I look at this, I could make this a little bigger, maybe easier to see here in the classroom. 200% be too much? Oh, it actually might be good to full, fill up the whole screen. Uh, but it says calculate the impulse imparted by this blow. All right, well, I'm going to grab my calculator and come over to here. And I'm going to go, all right, so number 10 says impulse. And so I want to just, just point out that that means change in momentum. And maybe you remember as we started today and we left off yesterday, we said that would equal to the force multiplied by the contact time. And so fortunately, that's pretty easy to do for this problem because they said the force from this punch, this blow, is what? 1,000 Newtons and it's going to hit somebody for... Points one five seconds, and so that means move the decimal three, one, two, three, and then the units would be a Newton times a second. You might also remember when we started this chapter, I said there's two ways to list the units of momentum. Uh, one is kilogram meters per second, and that would work. Another one is a Newton times a meter. Uh, I think in this case, when you're talking about impulse and change in momentum, and if you're focused on force and time, it's probably best to leave it that way. Although this is a little more fundamental, and so I naturally lean towards this one, but I think in this case, I'll just put a Newton times a second. And of course, you can see that buried inside this Newton is that kilogram meter per second squared. So when you multiply by a second, one of them goes away and you end up with just that. So there is part A of the problem. Uh, part B says, okay, uh, what is the opponent's final velocity if his mass is 105 and he is motionless in mid-air when struck say near the center of mass. So in other words this change in momentum is then being delivered to the opponent. So the opponent gains what the first contestant is delivering. And so I would then say for part B that the change in momentum is this 150. And now I'll write it as a kilogram meter per second squared, saying this is what the opponent gained. This is 
the change in momentum. This is what is being given to the opponent by this object making contact. And so like I said, momentum works really great when we're talking about the interaction of two objects. That's usually a key doing a problem, especially a test problem. You're like, ooh, should I do this with what technique? And if you start to see two objects interacting, hopefully that sends off little flashing lights saying, ooh, momentum, 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 okay? And so we've got, in this case, a boxing match, and we got two objects interacting, two, two athletes as they're hitting each other here. All right, so the opponent then would have a change in momentum of this, which of course I calculated using force and contact time, but now I'm going to also point out that the change in momentum would be mass times the change in velocity. Coming from the fact that momentum is mass times velocity. So we can figure out what the change in velocity is by taking this 150 kilogram meters per second and dividing it by the mass of the opponent, which I think they said was 105 kilograms. And of course, you'll notice I'm using the principle of conservation of momentum, which remember we said only works for your isolated object, right? It only works if you're talking about just those two objects interacting. So you'll notice that in order to help you understand that, the author says, hey, let's pretend the opponent at that moment is in the air. So in other words, they don't have the force of friction interacting with their feet. Otherwise, they, you know, don't, it doesn't obey the law of conservation of momentum. It's not an isolated system. So we don't need to worry about the part that he's in the midair when it comes to our calculations, but I do want to point out, we wouldn't even call these calculations valid unless we could ignore the interaction of the feet with the floor. And so that is an important part of the, of the problem. Anyway, so this would be the change in velocity. And so I'm going to assume that the opponent has no horizontal velocity. So if the opponent was just kind of, you know, in the air when they got hit, they would go from zero and then be pushed back by this speed. Of course, at this point, they don't say where they were punched, although it does say near the center of mass, so maybe it's somewhere in the rib cage here or something in the stomach, and so it's like, boom, and then they would be pushed backwards. And that would be the speed. Whereas this would be a little different. It says calculate the recoil velocity of the opponent's 10 kilogram head. So in other words, what if the punch hit the head instead of the whole body? Okay. Now again, we have to say, well, it has to be an isolated system. And I realize that that's not completely true. The neck muscles would be part of this. But again, let's say the opponent didn't see it coming. They got, you know, so they were looking this way and got from the side or, or whatever. But without any strength from the neck, let's just run this problem and say, well, then how fast would a head be whiplashed? And so in C, I would have the same equation. I would have the 150 kilogram meters per second. I would then have the mass. I would then have the change in velocity. But this time, I would be dividing by a much smaller mass of only 10 kilograms, resulting then in a much larger change in velocity. So a blow to the body doesn't move very far. A blow to the head in the game of boxing is preferred uh, than a blow to the body because that's what's really going to give damage to your opponent and eventually tire your opponent out or knock the opponent out. And that's how you play the game of boxing. So this speed would be really fast. Now obviously at some point the neck 
would add an external force to that and so the head would slow down but of course all kinds of consequences as a result of that and th th it could be game over right there that it's over a good blow like this to the head and it's probably over and I think that's the whole point of the author's last piece is uh, you know what are the consequences of this what do you see the difference and I think from a physics point of view the, the difference is do you, do you see how the mass made a big difference it was the same force it's where I started this and said if I had a bicycle and a car and I applied the same force to them that's what's going on here you give them the same change in momentum but with the different mass you give them a different speed and so there is a different result there all right well let's try another one here I uh, put number 23 next on my my list here uh, let's give this one a try here uh, hopefully this one looks a little bit like the ones I was doing here a moment ago here but it says train cars are coupled together uh, by being bumped into one another Suppose that two loaded train cars are moving towards one another. The first having a mass of 150,000 kilograms and a velocity of 0.3, and the second one having mass of 110,000 kilograms and a velocity of negative 0.12. What is their final speed? All right. Well, like I said, this isn't too much different than the one I set up but the reason I picked it is it does have a negative sign in there and so one thing I wanted to emphasize then is that when we started momentum I made this comment that I think working with momentum is a little bit harder than energy I think that's why your author did energy first and then momentum because momentum is a vector and so the direction becomes in, important. Uh, it's hard to imagine then something that hits something really hard and that this bounces off. That actually has a larger change of momentum than if it just did this. See, because this would go from, say, 10 to 0. But if you bounce off, you go from 10 to, like, negative 5. And from a 10 to a negative 5 is a change of 15. And so negative numbers come into play. And that's really what is, I'm hoping you see in this problem. All right? So... As I write down number 23, I'll say this. The initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. And of course, I've been saying that a few times. I'll say it again. This is kind of what the whole chapter centers around. And so now I can write out like we were doing before, M1, V1 initial, plus M2, V2 initial, so that would be the total momentum before they collide. That would have to equal to M1 V1 final and M2 V2 final. Conservation of momentum. So in this case, let's come back and then apply the specifics of this problem. And so the first object is moving in the positive direction of point three, has a mass of 150,000. So I'm going to put 150,000 kilograms moving with a speed of 0.3 meters per second. Now the second object, if I remember right, was 110 kilograms but it was coming towards it and that's what they're saying the second object having mass of 110 has a velocity of negative and so what we have is two coming together and they're, they're not going the same speed this negative 0.12 is 
a little less than half. So negative 0 0.12 meters per second. Now I'll pause right there because there is something that hopefully you begin to kind of get a gut feeling as you learn the physics. Notice when two things interact, if the momentum is conserved and they're, they're, they're coming towards each other, one is going to be positive and one is going to be negative. And if they stick together, you can then say that what I really have is m1 plus m2 times the final speed. And so that's just one number. And will it be positive or will it be negative would depend on is the positive momentum greater or less than the negative momentum. And so when two things collide together, notice that the end result moves in a direction with the one with the most momentum. Notice I didn't say the one that was the heaviest. Right? It doesn't necessarily go in the direction of the heaviest object. It doesn't necessarily go in the direction of the fastest object. It goes in the direction with the most momentum. And maybe this answers our first part of this chapter of why think about the two together? And, and that's why. It's a collectiveness of the mass and the velocity together that's going to be the end result of what direction these go. So in my case, you could quickly see that the positive, for both reasons, it has more mass and more speed than the negative. So when these collide, they're going to be going in the positive direction. But when one has a faster speed and a lower mass than the other, Sometimes it's hard to tell until you put the numbers in the calculator and go, okay, which one had more momentum? And so is it, you know, bad guy running at you or fast small bullet? You know, which one has more momentum? And that's going to be the end result of when they collide. What direction does it go? So in this case, I can just add them together here and take 150,000 and 110,000 and get 260,000. And then the only thing that is unknown is the velocity. And so let's see what I get. So we have 150, 1, 2, 3,000 times 0.3. Uh, subtract 110, 3,000 times 0.12. Uh, that does come out to be a positive number of 31,800. I'll then divide it by 260, 1, 2, 3,000, and resulting in a small positive speed of 0 0.122 meters per second. Mm. And so there it is. Uh, now, maybe I better do one more. Uh, let me look. What number was that? 23? Uh, I do have a little list, but uh, maybe video solutions are better than continuing on. But I wanted to point out something else. Let's see. Um, 29 was next on my list. That I think is the same conclusion here. Maybe it's number 50 because there's one last thing in this chapter that goes together with the vectors ah, that I wanted to point out and it's illustrated here really well in number 50. And so I'm going to start number 50 with the same phrase that I said back here in 23. Remember they're vectors, which is why I put positive and negative, but then also remember if they're vectors, they would have x and y components. And so we could have things interacting in two dimensions. And that's what this one illustrates. And so I'm going to start off by saying, all right, the definition of momentum is mass times the 
velocity. And so, when I write up here that the initial momentum is equal to the final, I'm going to add an extra piece that I haven't needed to do yet, and that's to say the momentum in the x directions match. And so I'm going to split my paper in two, uh, like you've seen me do in the past, anytime I have like forces and I have these vectors or this projectile motion, I've been saying it's pretty important then to separate those into one column involving the X motion and one column involving the Y motion. And then, of course, how you ultimately calculate it kind of depends on what's given. This one's not too bad because we don't have complex components. Watch, watch this here. It says, uh, we have two cars collide on an icy intersection. Now, the nice thing about intersections is they usually come in at right angles, so one can be moving in the X and one can be moving in the, in the Y. All right, so two cars collide in an icy intersection and they stick together after the collision. So they crunch and bumpers get locked and then they slide off in some direction. Okay, if the first car has a mass of 1,200 kilograms and is approaching at 8 meters per second due south. All right, so if I was making a compass rose, and making the y-axis north due south would be in a negative direction, negative y direction, okay? Uh, the second car has a mass of 850 and is approaching at this speed due west. So one car is going this way south and the other car is going this way towards the west. And then maybe I should put east and west. And using the traditional grid, that would be a negative y here and a negative x here. Okay. And so if I come over to my little chart here, I would say, all right, let's do the x direction. So when it came for the first car, I would say, how much momentum do I have in the x direction? I would say zero. The first car is only going south. And because it's going south, all of its momentum is in the y direction, so I'll put a negative, and its mass was 1,200 kilograms at a speed of 8 meters per second. Now the second car has a mass of 850 and is going 17 but west. So I would say 850 and 17 and I'll put a negative and so this is the momentum of the second car. It's all X and no Y. But again, notice that I have two cars, so I've added the momentum in the x direction for each car. I've also added the momentum in the y direction for each car, although it's pretty easy because that one was a zero and that one was a zero, so there wasn't really any hard addition to do. But I do need to point out that this is our conservation of momentum. Calculate the final velocity. Okay, so what this is saying is they would stick together and uh, this would be the mass times the final speed in the x direction and over here would be the mass times the final speed in the y direction. All right. Since they stick together, this total mass now would be, uh, let's see, 1,208 is 2,050. So 2,050 
times the final velocity in the x direction. And so grabbing my calculator, I'm going to go ahead and take the 850 times the faster car and then divide it by 2050 and say, okay, in the x direction, it would be going negative 705 meters per second. And over here, doing the same logic, they've stuck together, so the mass is 2050, and I would have final speed in the y direction. So let me take this 1200 times 8, then divided by 2050 gives me a speed of negative 4.68 meters per second in the y direction. Now I guess I'm not completely done because all I've done here is conserved momentum, but I want to pause and say notice I did conservation of momentum in the x separate and then conservation of momentum in the y also separate. And so if I just kind of come back here and put a grid, this would say I am going to be going 7, so maybe about this far over on the negative x-axis and maybe down about that far and so the two are going to be doing something like that. So a car coming south, collides with a car headed west, they hit, they stick together, and they go off in a direction, again, not a 45 degree direction, it's not like they're equal, it's how much momentum do they have. And you can begin to see that even though this car is lighter, because of its high speed, it actually has more momentum, and it ends up after the crash having more momentum in the x direction than in the y direction, because it started that way. It started with more momentum in the x direction. Even though the car is lighter, it's going faster. It's both of those together. And so I think we can finally get to the answers as calculate the, the final velocity. So the final velocity, now that we know the two pieces of it, would be the 705 squared and the 4.68 squared taking the square root. And so 7.05 squared plus the 4.68 squared equals and square root of all of that, coming up with a total speed of 8.46 meters per second. So here is answer A. Now, now watch this. How much kinetic energy is lost? So this hopefully looks like the one where I had the collision. They actually bump, they actually rub. There, there's actually going to be some heat created. So we call this an inelastic collision. Uh, by the way, we often call things that stick together perfectly inelastic collisions. Uh, I, I don't know if we necessarily need that extra term in there because you could have things that bump and rub and then they don't stick. So there is some heat but they didn't stick together. And so if they stick, they make the most heat. Notice I didn't say fully heat because they still got to be moving because of conservation of momentum. So they can never convert all of their kinetic energy into heat. And so that's what we call it perfectly inelastic. It's when they stick together is you're going to create the most heat, but never all the kinetic energy because we got to conserve momentum. All right. By the way, notice I keep using the words elastic and inelastic connected to the energy, not the momentum. Whether the collision is elastic or inelastic, momentum is conserved. The words elastic and inelastic have to do with the kinetic energy or heat. Okay, And this one, they stick together, and so this was probably going to create a lot of kinetic energy. All right, so why don't I do this? Why don't I ask how much initial kinetic energy do I have? 
and so I'll take the two cars. So one half times the first car, and so I think he labeled this as the first car. So 1,200 times 8 squared. And let me add that to 1 half times the second car, which is 850 times 17 squared. And so I have 161,000. I'll do three significant figures. And energy is measured in joules. So I have 161,000 joules before the collision. That's the total kinetic energy of the two of them. Then after the collision, I guess I can think of it as one big object. And so let me add the masses together. Oh, I guess I already did over here where I got the 2,050. All right. So there's the total mass added together. Uh, let me multiply that by one half. And then let me multiply that by the speed squared. And it looks like after the collision, I have 73,000 and I'll call it a four zero zero joules. And now did they ask for the heat or the kinetic energy? How much kinetic energy is then lost? And so using our principle of conservation of energy, I'm saying that whatever energy you start with must equal with what you end with and this hopefully looks a lot like the lab we did yesterday where we had an impact of two objects. And so we can figure out then how much is lost or how much heat is created by the molecules rubbing on each other by subtracting these two. So 161, one, two, three thousand minus this last answer is about 87,600 joules is the answer to how much heat. So again, this is a good one as a grand finale to say, remember, momentum is a vector. So we got to do x and y. And remember, not only is momentum conserved, but energy is conserved. And I used both in this problem, right? I used the principle of conservation of momentum, x and y, to figure out their speeds, and then I used that to figure out how much heat. And so that's right, right here. Uh, this energy goes into the deformation. Note that because both cars have an initial velocity, you cannot use the equation for conservation of momentum along the x, s, and y. Instead, you must look, huh? Uh, not sure what he's trying to say there, but I'm going to call it good for this chapter. Why don't we take our break and we will get started in chapter 9 after our 15 minute break. Yeah. All right.